three-bedroom Dutch Colonial, aisle five. New construction duplex, aisle seven. Welcome to the housing market. I'm with Redfin, and I'm here to help. Oh, I love Redfin, but I need an agent to sell my house. Redfin has agents, and they're great. They sell twice as many homes, so they have the skills to help you sell for more than the home next door. Huh, and here I thought Redfin was just an app I was addicted to. We're so much more, but thank you. Want to win? Sell with Redfin. It's real estate done right. Open house, aisle four. Learn more at redfin.com. The secret location of the treasure is revealed to a chosen few, and it's clear that there is mischief afoot. H. Bedford Jones, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. Many, many thanks to our financial supporters who pitch in every month to help us keep the lights on. If you enjoy the show, please sign up to be a supporter for as little as $5 a month. We'll give you a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook order. Give more and you get more. Go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. Thank you so much. The Man in the Brown Suit by Agatha Christie will be available on July 12th. Keep an eye open for a healthy sampling around that time. For those of you who listen through YouTube, our channel is now updated and will continue to be updated in the future. A big shout out to A.J. Shuck, also an audiobook narrator, who is helping us out there. Thanks, AJ. And now, Pirate's Gold, Part 2 of 4, by H. Bedford Jones. Chapter 4 We gathered in the stern cabin, and the new sunlight streamed down through the small skylight above, and illumined the cabin with a glory of radiance as the ship rolled. Between stern window and skylight, we had plenty of light. The cabin was not ornate. It was our mess cabin, aft, and was meant for use, not for ornament. Along the stern wall, under the window, ran a long file of muskets, locked in their rack by an iron bar and padlock. A locker for charts, another for instruments, a huge cupboard that held dishes and wine and other things, table and chairs and iron lanterns slung in gimbals. This was all. Under the table was a trap leading to the lazarette below. With the traces of grief gone from her cheeks, Polly Langton sat down, and we after her. For lack of mourning, she wore her gray gown, a kerchief about her throat fastened by a gold brooch. And what a head was this, rising above! All a glory of yellow gold hair, and a red-cheeked, west country face that was filled with sweetness and ability, browned by the sun and air, with skin delicately textured as any court lady's. Yet the splendor of her face lay in the eyes. Gray, with golden flecks were they, level, and meeting a man's gaze fair, and unafraid, deliberate eyes, not to be hurried or overborne. Through these windows one perceived the fine woman's soul within, shrinking a little, yet meeting the issues of fate with a certain cool poise that was almost disdain. Could this girl ever be waked into hot passionate anger or emotion, I thought, she would stop at nothing. Painted and powdered, patched and gowned, Polly Langton might have been no beauty, but in her simplicity she was beautiful enough. I did not miss the grip that was in Russell's eyes as he watched her, nor did she, for she gave him a slow look that made him change countenance. Ned Lowe, when we were seated, put on the table before him that little black snuff-box which I had brought him from Langton. Then Russell spoke up, Civilly, but with a thrust to his words. One minute, Captain. This is secret company business. 
Why does George Roberts sit with us? At my bidding. And Ned Lowe smiled a little, taking no offense. He is my friend, and I trust him to the full. Also, I propose that he is to have a full third of my share of the gold when recovered. I want no gifts, Ned, I intervened. No gift at all, George Roberts, he returned, a somber look in his eyes. We don't know what lies ahead of us, but I think you are going to be a great man in this enterprise, and here you, a captain like myself, are serving as mate. Sounds, man. Was it not agreed between us that first night we met? As to that, I can't say, was my response, and Ned uttered a laugh. It's a company matter, spoke up Russell, an ugly note in his voice. Put it to the vote, I say. It's no company matter what I do with my own, snapped Lowe angrily, a dark color rising in his cheeks. But the deciding vote lies with Miss Polly, and I put the vote. What say you, madam? All this while the girl had been looking at me with appraising eyes. Now she leaned back in her chair and spoke as if she had no interest in the affair. I agree, she said quietly, though it is your own business, as you say. So Russell sat back and bit his lip. Now, began Ned Lowe, let us inform Captain Roberts of our quest. You have heard of the pirate Franklin, George? Some time since I was in company with him, when he took a huge amount of Moradors out of a Portuguese Indiaman from Goa. He broke off, for the girl was holding his eye. He flushed a trifle once more. Then it is true, she asked coolly, that you and Mr. Russell were on the account, as they call it? That is true, said Ned. It is also true that I would touch no penny of the loot, my lady. Then. I had no use for it. Now I have use. Captain Franklin buried a great share of the gold, which he swore belonged to me, on one of the Verde Islands. He and I alone knew the place. It is this gold that we go to recover. According to the agreement, a third share goes to me, another to John Russell, another to Mistress Langton here. Out of my share, a third goes to Captain Roberts. This is understood and agreed? A nod came from the other two. But now Polly Langton spoke up, cool and well-considered words, and her speech must have come as a tremendous shock to each one of us. Since Captain Roberts is a friend of yours, Captain Lowe, and is to share in your proceeds, he is evidently tarred with the same brush as you and Mr. Russell. By your own word you are pirates, how my poor uncle came to his death I know not, but I think it was through entering into this scheme of yours. Shame on you! He was an honest city merchant, and you bloody men tangled him in your ruthless wiles. Had it not been for you, we would still be living in Lombard Street, and happy there. She paused, coldly deliberate. Ned Lowe was staring at her like a man thunderstruck. John Russell was all agape but harsh amusement was rising in his eyes. Before it could break out, she was calmly continuing her speech. I promised my uncle to take this gold if we got it. What I do with my share is another matter. I may be penniless, but beyond taking out what my poor uncle put into this venture, I'll not turn this bloody coin to my own use. Very well, then. I want it understood plainly that I am a full third partner in this enterprise, and intend to remain so. I'm not to be put in a corner and disregarded because I am a woman. My uncle picked a good crew for this voyage. If you gentlemen think you can run away with this ship or go pirating, you'll discover otherwise. We are here for a certain purpose, and none other. Now her voice softened, perhaps from what she read in the eyes of Ned Lowe. Indeed, I do not mean to speak like a shrew, but there's the fact. You're pirates. I am a woman. But I have some ability at sea. The crew are honest men. 
I think you mean me well, and will respect the oath which you gave my poor uncle. But I want to have things understood. Already the men are whispering that you intend running away with the ship. Be careful, that's all. I am through, Captain Lowe. There was a space of silence while we stared at her. It was easy to perceive that Dennis Langton had kept her ignorant of his past. She thought him a good, honest merchant, not knowing that he had buccaneered with the worst of them, had partnered with the infamous Spriggs. She was acting upon genuine belief, deeming the rest of us mighty, insecure men. Russell uttered a laugh and began to speak, a sneer in his heavy eyes. Nedlow turned to him, face set and cold, and uttered three words. Be silent, John. Russell checked himself, shrugged, and leaned back, grinning. Thus the matter passed. Ned was trying to keep from the poor girl the knowledge of what her uncle had been, was trying to leave her memory of him unsoiled. Yet he was a fool for his pains. She was bound to learn the truth, eventually. Since I haven't known you or your friends three days, Miss Polly, I said easily, you can't charge me with their crimes. My record is clear for all men to read, and if you'll go out to Virginia, you'll find that it's not a bad record either. And as to Captain Lowe, I believe you'll find that he's... Stow it, George, snapped Lowe. I obeyed, for he was angry. He looked across the table at the girl, and she at him, though her gaze had softened a bit. Very handsome he was, and too proud to take notice of her words. He opened the black snuff box that lay before him and took out the hard, folded bit of vellum, all the while keeping his eyes on the girl. And then he spoke to her briefly. Dear lady, you have naught to fear from us, upon my honour. Now let us to business. I propose to lay this little chart before you. Franklin himself made it. And then destroy the thing. We shall keep the position of the Mordors in our own minds. If, by any chance of the sea, we do not reach the Verde Islands, then whichever one of us can first come to the spot is at liberty to take the gold. There was a little silence while he opened up the vellum. It was not easy, for the whitish skin was hard and dry and promised to crack at the folds. As he opened it slowly, I saw that on one side of it was writing and that over the ink there had been wax laid on and polished, keeping the ink waterproof. Then abruptly the voice of the girl leaped at us. Soft it was, but uttered in broad Devon that betrayed her apprehension and fear. Quick, catchman, look to the door! She said afterward that the door catch had moved slightly. Russell saw it, for he was out of his chair, silent, and with a stealthy agility that amazed me, and in two steps was at the door. He opened it. There came a terrific crash as a tray dropped to the floor, and we saw Dickon, the cabin boy, outside. Russell had him by the shoulder and heaved him inside and swore at the ale that spattered his feet. What means this, lad? demanded Ned Low angrily. Who bade you listen at doors? The little imp was no whit in awe or frightened. He faced us in stiller defiance. He could not have seen fifteen years, yet the debased evil of his features would have done credit to any pirate. And he glowered at us with all the hatred of a man for men. It bain't so, he said stoutly. I warrant a listening, Master Low. Cook Philip sent me with breakfast for mistress. And now look at an pewter bent ale gone. Russell gave him a haughty cuffing and threw him out into the passage. As the boy picked himself up, I saw the look he flung at Russell, a deadly, vicious look, such as comes from the eyes of a disturbed and angry snake. Then Russell slammed the door shut and came back to his chair. I was mistaken, spoke up Polly contritely. I thought perhaps someone was listening. I'm sorry if little Dickens suffered for my error. He's not hurt, said Russell. Now Ned out with it. Which one of the islands is it? 
St. Vincent, answered Captain Lowe, holding the vellum spread out under his fingers. You know it? I have not landed there, said Russell. Franklin, as it marked, 16 degrees 49 minutes north latitude by 7 degrees 6 minutes west longitude from the Cape de Verde, went on Ned Lowe. But I think he's off a point or two. George, get out the charts, will you? We'll show Miss Polly just where we are going. I got out the proper chart, by which time the others were ready to relinquish the bit of vellum to me, though Russell watched me keenly while I handled it. Upon it was rudely scratched the outline of St. Vincent, one of several uninhabited and rocky islands to the northwest of the Cape Verde group. On the northeast tip of the island was marked a cross with the bearings below. I uttered an exclamation. Upon my word, gentlemen, I remember this place. I was there for turtle while we were making salt at the Ile de Salle. I had the very spot, and we had best lay up the ship in the cove at the north side of the island, which is the closest. It is ill spoke of on the chart, said Russell, looking up. Ay, for the trades blow square into it, I assented. But a ship may be towed out by boats during the morning calm. I've seen the St. Nicholas men do it often. And the bay is so smooth that you may lay a ship ashore without the least damage. Memorize those bearings, George, said Ned Low. We must destroy the thing. That was an easy matter, the more so that I knew the exact spot. The northeast side of the island, unlike the rest, is low and sandy. A cable length off the shore at low tide is a round, smooth rock that rises like a broken column out of the water to the height of ten feet. Franklin had marked it Tower Rock and there could be no mistake. Bearing from this due west a quarter mile were a group of dragon trees. Now I recalled the trees quite clearly, since they were the only group of this species which had escaped destruction, and I was interested in their singular nature and had even visited them, getting some of the gum. Half a cable length to the west and by north of these trees was a large boulder jutting out of the sand, and the gold was buried on the north side of that boulder. So said the vellum, and you may judge of my interest in the matter, and of how the others were interested to hear me tell of the place as I knew it, though I did not recall that boulder. Franklin had been a few points amiss on his bearings of the island, but that was nothing. He certainly was not astray on his local features. Do you think, Polly Langton asked me, a sparkle in her eyes, that anyone might have come there and found the treasure? Not unless he were looking for it, I told her. No one comes to that island, except for turtle, or to shoot wild goats, or to fish. The Black Island men from St. Nicholas come there often, but they make no stay. There is fresh water in a large bay on the northwest side of the island. Porto Grande, it is called. Aye, it is marked. Ned Lowe rolled up the big chart. Russell, he went on. Have you finished with the bearings? And you, George? And you, Miss Polly? We had it all in our heads well enough. So Captain Lowe struck a light, and presently the white vellum curled and crumpled and became a black ash on the table. Then Lowe looked up at us and laughed in his gay manner. And now, comrades, a sneaker to our good luck and fortune. He brought wine and flagons from the cupboard, and we pledged Franklin's gold, the girl with a flash to her eye and color to her cheek. Then, since Polly Langton had not yet broken her fast, I went to hasten Dickon with his second tray, and so took charge of the deck, and this ended our conference. We had now no further talk among ourselves of the gold, for it was a dangerous matter, and would keep well enough until we arrived at the spot. With the next morning indeed foul weather came upon us, not contrary but heavy gales that swept us on our course yet kept all hands on the jump. Day after day they continued unabated, and the King Sagamore, for all her battering and straining, 
leaked no more water than could be got rid of in an hour's pumping of mornings. During those days we were too busy to have much time for mischief, which, in light of after events, I think was most fortunate. There was indeed some preaching and ranting up forward, but since it gave the men an outlet we made no objection, even when Gunner Basil made long-winded discourses of a Sabbath. What with the ship's roll, few of us were not seasick at times, and I saw little of Polly Langton these days. What little I did see, however, woke in me admiration for her bearing and character and spirit. I think she had ceased to class me with pirates, for she was smiling and merry when we met, and sometimes took the wheel during my watch on deck, fighting it with the skill of any man among us. Dickon the cabin boy was quite sick during this period, which was another fortunate thing in my opinion. We replaced him for the time with Thomas Winter, the long-faced half-wit of whom I have spoken. A curious man was that, who seldom spoke, never met the level look of an eye, and mingled not at all with the other men. He had been long at sea. His hands and forearms were much tattooed yet none could get him to speak of his goings and comings. He had a vacancy in his aspect that surely belied his wits. This fellow Winter also seemed to be taken with strange spells. One day at noon we had a fleeting glimpse of the sun, and after shooting him with low, I hastily left the deck and jumped below to make calculations and verify our reckoning. As I came into the cabin I found Gunner Basil there, and the man Thomas Winter was speaking to him. I had chanced to hear only a few words, but those were spoken in a new voice to me, a sane and sound and bellowing voice. I damn your eyes, Winter was roaring at the gunner. Who are you to tell me what to do, you whelp of Satan? You stole your jaw, blast you. I'm the one. He broke off at sight of me and cringed. I was the more astonished, for Gunner Basil seemed to be taking his oaths with shamefaced manner. What's this? I broke in upon them. Winter? Was that you I heard? What do you mean? Pardon, sir, he mumbled. The roaring winds do fetch gusty words out of me at times, sir, and all the seven devils are perched up aloft. He shambled away out of the cabin. Gunner Basil looked at me, wagged his head sorrowfully, and tapped his skull. He let out his nasal whine. Bear with him, sir, bear with him. The poor afflicted fellow deserves the patience of all men. If he is a bit daft, he is also a good seaman. Can hold her by the wind with never a flutter of canvas from hour to hour. With an impatient word I settled down to my figures. Afterward, I remembered again the complete change of voice and language which had been effected in the daft man, and how he had cringed at sight of me. This wakened my pity, and I thought no more of the incident. Chapter 5 Fair weather came back to us as suddenly as it had departed, and found us well advanced on our course though much strained and battered about. Within two days, all our sick were recovered, and we fell to work overhauling the rigging as we sailed, for the new cordage had stretched abominably and must be repitched into the bargain. Hardly had we come into clear skies, however, than trouble let loose aft, as if it had been waiting for fine weather before breaking. We were heeling smartly along under a spanking breeze, out of the northeast and by east, everything drawing well, and four bells of the afternoon had just struck. Old Humphrey Stave was seated by the forward water butt, working with palm and needle at a spare topsail, when the bosun appeared and talked for a little with his crony. Then Pilcher came aft, touched his forelock, begged some tobacco from me, and fell into talk. He had something at the back of his mind, but was slow in leeching it. Cook be heatin' of some pitch in the galley, he observed, when you're ready to get that forward rigging painted, sir. Simon Blake was at the wheel. When it's ready, I said, 
Send a man aft to relieve Simon here, and let him and Ezra Blake take up the buckets. They're good, careful men, and I don't want the deck spattered. Aye, sir. Pilcher shook his earrings, then gave me a queer look. There be some wild talk forward, sir, he went on. What about, Bose? That you've been on the account, sir, and I give the lie to it. But that bain't all. I don't like them there godly men, nor they me. But I've heard whispers. They do say as you and Mr. Russell and Mr. Lowe ain't doing right by the lass, and that she's mortal afraid of you gentlemen. Then there's somewhat about Mr. Russell being one Portuguese Lopez, and it ain't no secret that Mr. Lowe is bloody Ned. Who's doing this talk? I demanded, frowning. We were beyond earshot of the helmsman. That I don't know, sir. Just drifting it is. These godly scum forward seem to think they'll be made turn pirate. We'll work it out of them, I said cheerfully. Run along and attend to that pitch now. He swung forward. Barely had he gone when from below came Polly Langton and Captain Lowe. They flung me a bare nod, then resumed some talk they had started below decks, and I saw that the girl was flushed and earnest while poor Ned Lowe was cold and set and hard in the face. They paused by the windward rail, so that their words came to me and to Simon Blake at the wheel. And have you no shame for it? demanded the girl hotly. Shame? Ned uttered a curt, bitter laugh. By the Lord Harry, no. If I'd hanged twice a hundred men, and knew that twice that number would yet die to my hand, I'd go on to the end and be proud of it. I am sorry to hear such words on your lips. And she spoke gravely, her anger held down. I had thought you a gentleman, and I find you glorying in your bloody deeds, in your piracies and murders. Go on to the end, you say. Do you dare admit that your share of this enterprise is to be used in the same fashion? That if the venture succeeds, if you buy out this ship from our company, you go on the account once more? I cursed under my breath, for Simon Blake was drinking all this in, as his dour face testified, yet I dared not intervene. Aye, said Ned Lowe, I'll not lie to you, Miss Polly. Oh, shame on you, she cried out, to think that you and your precious friends so inveigled my poor uncle, you and they, to take this money and use it for more piracy and murder? How do I know you and they will respect that oath to my uncle? Why, take us on trust. Ned broke into a laugh, half vexed, half of whimsical exasperation. As for my friends, I care not and know not what they'll do with their share. My share puts bloody Ned on his feet again, madam, and that's my own affair. She gave him a long look, eyes angry, bosom heaving. Then I am minded to draw out of this venture, sir. You can't. Lowe turned on her, pressed beyond endurance. This is a company matter, my girl. Don't try to make trouble. There's more behind it all than you know. There's more hangs on it than you know. We'll see you safe in London again with your share, and beyond that, have a care. This gold of Franklin's belongs to all of us, mind, not you alone. Now, whether she had meant her threat, I know not. But Simon Blake caught his breath sharply, and his face was set in grim lines. But the girl laughed out right merrily under the angry gaze of Ned Lowe. Perhaps she had only meant to tease him after all. Then she turned and went below without more speech, while Ned fell to pacing the quarterdeck. It was a moment after this that Thomas Winter, who was in my watch, came shambling aft to relieve Simon Blake from his trick. A few words passed between them. I stepped up, and Winter repeated the order to go forward and tar the lines. Blake nodded assent and obeyed. I followed forward, as Simon and Ezra Blake secured their buckets and brushes and came to a pause beside the water butt, 
where Humphrey Stave sat and sewed. Do those blunt lines in the forelift first, I told them. Then work in along the yards from each side, and do the shrouds as you come down. Simon, overhaul that loose foot rope at the strap on the foreyard. Tighten it up and watch your seizing. Aye, sir, responded Simon, passing the lanyard of his bucket about his neck. The two men mounted, and a moment later I turned to find Ned Lowe at my elbow. He gave me a whimsical glance and chuckled softly. Caught the bastard and no mistake, eh? You heard? I nodded. I, Ned. So did Blake at the helm. The men forward are talking already about things. Oh, trice up a couple and give em a dozen apiece, he said carelessly, and there'll be no more gossip. Somebody's been talking to the lass, though, and I don't like it. John Russell has his eye on her. You watch sharp, lad. Well, Humphrey Stave, how goes it with the palm? Man, that's as neat a patch as ever I saw laid. Old Humphrey squinted up over his spectacles. Aye, master, and thank ye. You and be a good judge of em, sir. For a moment, Lowe stood glancing around the deck. What he saw in that swift, eagle-like glance of his I never knew. But suddenly, his hand fell on my arm, and his voice sounded in my ear. Ah, oh, the urgency, the repressed fury of that voice. Quick, for the love of heaven. Loaded pistols in the chart locker. Get Russell and the gunner. Don't run aft now. Easy does it. My blood jumped. I turned and walked aft, seeking as I did so what had caused his abrupt alarm and caution. Except that most of the port watch were on deck sunning themselves, I could see nothing out of the ordinary. The men seemed to eye me hard as I passed aft, but that might have been imagination. The quarterdeck was empty, save for the long figure of Thomas Winter at the helm. Once at the companionway, I was down the ladder with a leap and darted aft to the cabin. Russell was doubled up in my cabin. I paused to fling open the door. John, up and arm, quick man! He had his own arms, and usually wore them, so I darted on into the main cabin, and in the chart locker came upon two pistols, loaded and pinned. I ran back, found Russell sitting on the edge of his bunk and blinking at me, and swore at him. On deck! Swift about it! I ran on down the passage and came to the companion ladder. As I started up it, something flew out of the darkness below. A knife that wanged into the wood beyond my ear with a vicious song. Who flung it I could not see and dared not pause to ask, for I was in fear of what might be happening forward. Up the ladder and to the deck again, and just in time to see it happen. They thought me gone below, of course thought Ned Lowe alone there among them, the dogs. As my head came up, I saw the thing fall, saw the bucket, heavy with pitch, leave the hand of Simon Blake and go hurtling down from the topsail yard. Lowe did not see it, but he saw Boson Pilcher gape upward and heard Pilcher cry out and leap aside blindly. There was a terrible, dull sound and old Humphrey Stave threw out his arms and bent forward across his sail with his skull stove in. Another and more frightful cry burst from Pilcher. I saw the boatswain lean back, saw his arm curl and straighten, saw his knife go flaming up through the air. Take it, you damned murderer of old men, he yelled out, and Simon Blake took it fair in the throat and pitched off the yard clear of the ship's side. Now there was a heave of men over Pilcher, and I, running forward, saw Ezra Blake lean over from the futtock shrouds and drop his own heavy bucket toward Ned Lowe. The latter, warned by my shout, leaped aside once more, and the bucket missed. I flung up one pistol and shot the treacherous hound, and he fell straight at the foot of the foremast, where men were rearing cutlasses from the rack. Then Ned Lowe was into them with both hands, and as one man swung at him with the blade, I fired again and that man fell. All this, and the body of Ezra dropping among them, and the sight of me running forward with John Russell behind me and the gunner also on deck, gave them pause. Pilcher broke loose and stood beside the captain, and I joined them. Then came Russell 
leaping like a hound across the deck with a pistol in one hand and knife in the other, and a wild grin upon his dark face. Behind him came Gunner Basil, long hair flying, pale eyes darting about. Up with those cutlasses again, ye dogs, shouted Low, and they obeyed sullenly. So it's mutiny, is it? Murder and mutiny, ye swine of righteousness. You there about the arms, Rack, stand fast. Four of the men there were, still half determined to fly at us, and Low held out his hand toward them. Gunner Basil, trice up those four devils. Bose, pipe all hands and give those rascals two dozen. One of the other men stepped forward defiantly and stretched his arm at Pilcher. There's the man of blood, Captain, he shrilled forth. Flung his knife, he did, and murdered poor Simon Blake, as godly a man as ever walked. After Blake tried to stave in my head, eh? said Low, pale with fury. After he'd murdered poor Chips, eh? It was an accident, cried out the man. I seen his lanyard break, and... You lie, I said angrily. I saw him fling the bucket. You liar. Go and join these four scoundrels and take a dozen yourself for your lies. Approved, added Ned Low curtly. Bind these five men, you dogs, and do it swift. Where's the gunner? Here I be, sir. Gunner Basil came to the front. He gave an order, and for a moment I thought there would be open mutiny. Then, as John Russell grinned and lifted pistol, the men obeyed. The five about the mast were bound. Now, men, said Low sternly, I want an explanation of this. Pick your spokesman and send him aft to me as soon as the lashing is over. He turned and walked aft. Then came Polly Langton running and joined Pilcher, who was holding the head of poor old Humphrey Stave in his arms. Tears coursing down his savage brown cheeks. Humphrey blinked up out of the blood and saw the girl there, white and feared. Oh, Minnie, Minnie, cried the dying man. Here's your lad, Humphrey. Come home again. Oh, Minnie, I had cried for ye. Home from sea, Minnie, with presents for ye. His head sagged over, and that was all save that Pilcher broke into a storm of sobbing and wild cursing grief. Then the girl's voice thrust in. What? What is all this? She saw the five men being led aft to the main. What have those men done? I heard shots. Murder and mutiny, lass, said John Russell, smirking at her. But for George Roberts here, they had murdered Ned Lowe and taken the ship. Aye, and they killed poor old Humphrey, I added. Bose, go and do your duty, man. Tears unwiped, Pilcher leaped up and ran aft for his lash. White-faced, the girl stared about, saw the five being triced up, and knew the purpose of it. I called to the other men about us, and at my order they laid out old Humphrey and Ezra Blake. Simon was gone into the deep already. The other man whom I had shot was but wounded across the scalp. Take charge here, John, I said to Russell. I must see to a matter below. I went aft, passing Ned Lowe, who stood white and stern at the rail of the quarterdeck, his eyes glittering fiercely. How far this mutiny extended we could not tell, of course, whether all the crew were in it or only the two Blakes. Perhaps indeed Simon Blake had merely seized the chance to kill the captain without premeditation. Going below, I looked along the ladder for that knife which had so narrowly missed my head. The knife was gone, and I swore roundly to myself over the fact. Either Gunner Basil or Russell had flung it, I felt convinced, and I suspected the former. As I looked, Dick and the cabin boy came sleepily to the foot of the ladder, rubbing his eyes. What be the fuss, sir? he asked. I was asleep down yonder. Get up and see, I responded, and let the flogging of better men keep you from evil courses, Yonker. Up with you. 
he went to the deck above, and I after him. And there I saw a thing that was bad for discipline. Pilcher had begun laying on the lash, and the first man under his whip was bloody, for the boatswain was in savage mind. But Polly Langton had stopped him, and now was standing by, looking aft at Ned Lowe, and demanding that the men be given fair trial. Poor lass. She little dreamed what her intervention was going to mean in the end. Dear girl, replied Ned softly enough, yet with steel in his voice. These men had tried to murder me and take the ship. They had done murder already. They're getting off light with two dozen lass. Stand aside and interfere not. I'll not have it, she stormed back at him. You bloody-minded pirates. This is past endurance. These poor men... Bows! Now the voice of Ned Lowe thundered out like a trumpet across the deck. Lay on, I bid ye. Pilcher shook his earrings, and the cat swung, and the man under it screamed out. At this Polly Langton turned about, and held out an arm to the men who watched the scene. Help me stop it, she cried wildly enough. Take the ship from these pirates, these murderous brutes. Come, men, stand by me. Don't let your comrades be lashed like dogs. Well, the words died on her lips as she saw the uselessness of it. John Russell, all again until his teeth flashed white in the sun, stood to one side, and the hearts of the men sickened in them under his look. So Polly knew that her plea was futile, and with a little groan that hurt my soul, she turned again to Ned Lowe. Well, do they call you bloody Ned? she said in a slow and deliberate voice that carried far. Never dare to speak to me again, you or your friends. I wash my hands of you and your filthy gold and all your doings. Go on, do your worst to these helpless men, but never speak to me. I command you. With this, she bent her head and tears on her cheeks went aft and so below. While Boson Pilcher, tears likewise on his own cheeks but from different cause, brought down the cat with all the brawn in the blow, so that the hurt man screamed again. Presently it was done, Gunner Basil standing by and counting the blows to each man. Then, the groaning dogs staggering forward, Nedlow summoned the spokesman from the other men. All this while Thomas Winder had stuck to the wheel, wagging his long face vacantly, but keeping the ship close to her course. The spokesman came aft. A young, hard-faced fellow he was, by name David Spry, and he poured forth a long and whining plea, full of pious sentiments. The gist of it was that none of the men had intended mutiny, that they believed Boson Pilcher had murdered Simon Blake and had so acted, that they were repentant and heartily sorry for their misdoing, and humbly begged forgiveness. All in all it was a moving and earnest plea, full of errant hypocrisy and a lie from start to finish. Nedlow told the man as much. What's got into you godly rogues, I don't know, he concluded. But I know who's master of this ship, and you'll know it. Every man of you. Go for it. All hands stand by to bury the dead at two bells in the next watch. That's all. David Spry went forward, and we shifted the men about so that the watches were again balanced. But Boson Pilcher sat up in the forechains and cried like a baby over the passing of old Humphrey. That evening, after the dead were gone, and it was again my watch, Ned Lowe came up to me as I was having the lights filled and placed. We were alone upon the quarterdeck, save for the man at the helm, and we were out of hearing. George, said Lowe quietly, what the hell can I do with her? She won't join us at mess, won't so much as speak to any of us aft. Her attitude has already had an effect on the men. Damn me, 
I can't take the girl by the neck and throttle her. If you did, Ned, and I checked myself, a low laugh came from him. Oh, why, you'd be at my throat. Well, add much joy to you of the vixen if you win her, an honest lass, with the courage of her convictions, but, oh, good Lord. The words came from him in a groan. Five years ago this night, I was a man in hell, George. Look ye now. I'm suspicious of this gunner Basil. Philip the cook came to me tonight, and says he, Basil and our half-wit Winter met outside the galley, and Winter drew a knife on the gunner, cursing him most vile. Now see what you've done, you bastard, says Winter. For tuppence I'd cut the rotten heart out of you for not waiting, you dog, you. That's strange talk for the daft man, George. And the cook says that Gunner Basil was in mortal fear. This winter may be harmless, but like most daft men, he may have dangerous spells. I don't doubt it, I answered, and told him of that day when I had come on Thomas Winter down in the cabin. Excitement seems to send the poor madman's wits flying. But what's all this got to do with five years ago tonight, Ned? I don't know, said he shortly enough. For a moment he laid his arm across my shoulders. Oh, lad, he said softly, don't you see that the lass is raising hell with those honest fools up forward, and herself all honest too? Aye, I told him, but how to prevent it? Ask the stars, George. And he drew away with a laugh. Damn me if I know. Good night. Chapter 6 All this while, I had not seen a great deal of John Russell. The little we saw of each other, however, intensified the feelings that had arisen between us that morning on the quay below London Bridge. I heartily detested his smooth, sneering ways, and I think he was unable to puzzle me out had not the honesty to take me for what I was, yet could not quite fathom me for a knave like himself. Ned Lowe, I felt certain, distrusted the man on general principles. Fools that we were. We might better have directed our suspicions elsewhere, had we known it. But how were we to know it? Thus moves life itself, towards some vain objective, only to find itself suddenly directed toward othersome. For now... Looking back at it all, I really believe that Russell was square enough in his intent toward the rest of us. But our mutual dislike ripened into distrust, and the distrust rotted into maggots of hatred, all quickly and suddenly. It happened one day when the wind was fitful and changing, and the air heavy with brooding storm, so that all hands were kept bracing about the yards and men's tempers were apt to fly out at nothing. Not that I make any excuse of this for my own part, since through several days Russell and I had been approaching a crisis. This came about, in some degree, through the attitude of Polly Langton. Ever since that day Humphrey Stave was slain, she had kept to her word and held no intercourse with any of us aft. Her meals were served in her own tiny box of a cabin, and she treated us with a stony silence as if we did not exist. When she walked the deck, it was forward, and often she talked with the men and sometimes would relent a little when I saluted her, though she spoke not. Because I perceived that she thus softened a little toward me, her manner irked me not at all, but John Russell it infuriated. I observed that after some meeting with her, he would walk the decks like a devil incarnate, raging among the men and once he beat David Spry so furiously with a belaying pin that the seamen bore the marks of it a fortnight. Not that he had cause, either. The men were tamed, were obedient and lively, and had given no further sign of any trouble. Between me and John Russell, however, the hot tropic sun quickened ill feeling. On the morning in question, we had a sharp exchange of words when watches were changed. Having lost three men, we were short in each watch, 
added to which one of the men was ill with the ague, passing from a quotidian into a tertian, and being too weak to move. So Russell desired to shift Boson Pilcher out of my watch into his own, which offer I very bluntly refused. We nearly came to blows over it, yet did not. At eight bells in the afternoon, I turned over the deck to him and went below at once to get some sleep. Storm was brewing, and the heaviness of the air had given me a headache. As I came below, I met Dickon in the passage and ordered him to fetch me a mug of ale into the main cabin. There I sat down to the table to pick our course on the chart, as we were getting close to the islands and had need of care. Hearing someone enter, I spoke over my shoulder without looking up, thinking it Dickon. We're past the Canaries, and I would we had some of that wine aboard. Go you and tell Philip to get a fresh butt brought up for it, for the water in that is foul, and to have it well lashed in place at once. Damn your impudence, said the voice of Russell. Run your own errands, you cursed Virginian. I turned to see Russell at the cupboard, pouring a cup of wine. Harkey, Russell, or Lopez, I told him. A little more civility, if you please. I took you for Dickon. The devil sink you and your takings, he broke in with a sudden access of fury, turning at me and snarling like a wolf. Just then Ned Lowe came into the cabin, and Russell gulped at his wine. Ned perceived nothing amiss, but came and glanced at the chart and chuckled merrily. Ah, good and well done, George. By the Lord Harry, we've a record to boast of this voyage. Hardly a ship spoke, not a headwind nor a calm, and a course fair and straight as an arrow to the islands. Gunners on deck, John? I must speak with him. He passed out and was gone. Russell looked after him with a dark sneer. Ah, you'll speak with Gunner Basil once too often, he growled. I've warned you against that pale-eyed devil, you poor fool of a gentleman. You keep your tongue off low, I snapped. He whipped out an oath, and I saw murder in his eyes. His hand dived down to the pistol in his belt. At that I was out of the chair and at him and knocked the pistol into the corner. His fist took me under the ear and smashed me against the wall. As I rose, I caught sight of Dickon, ale mug in hand, standing in the doorway and staring out of his evil eyes. Then Russell was atop of me, and his knife was out, but I met him with a blow from the shoulder that tapped the claret and got out from the wall. He came on, cursing and letting drive with the knife, but I evaded him and got home another blow. Then sanity began to crowd into my brain. Let be, you fool, I cried out, parrying his stroke. More of this and we'll all find ourselves... He stopped short in his stride like a man paralyzed, and for an instant I thought that my words had checked him. It was not my words or my fist, however. He stood there with the knife held out toward me, and slowly his fingers loosened, so that it dropped and tinkled on the floor. His eyes widened on me, and his mouth opened, but no words came forth. Then a bubble of red froth broke on his lips. He dropped to his knees and rolled down on the floor, and I saw the haft of a knife sticking out from his back. Even while I stared at him in blank horror and wonder, I caught the shrill voice of that devil's spawn, Dickon, from the companionway. Ahoy, Captain! he cried out. Captain Lowe! The mate had killed Mr. Russell, Captain! John Russell, dying, heard that lifting, piercing cry. He heaved upward, raised himself to one elbow, wrenched up his head and looked at me. A ghastly, twisted smile curled his lips as he slobbered the blood from his pierced lungs. He tried to speak and could not. Then sudden words burst from him. Now, where of them, Roberts, or you're snared. Tell Lo that the man, that Thomas Winter, he strangled in his own life stream and died on the word. Now came Ned Lowe running, with the imp Dickon pointing and crying at his heels, and behind them Gunner Basil and the boatswain. Some of the men were following, 
but Captain Lowe sent back an angry shout that checked them and ordered Pilcher back to keep the deck. The bosun obeyed with an ill grace and waved his hand to me before he went. Ned Lowe came on into the cabin. I seen it done, Captain, shrilled that little devil Dickon, pointing at me. Took him in the back, he did. You little liar, I burst forth angrily. It was you flung that knife. I started for him, but Gunner Basil whipped out a pistol at me, and I checked myself. A dying man does not waste words. John Russell had spent his last breath in warning me, and those pale, murderous eyes of the gunners told me who was back of this snare. I think Gunner Basil would have pistoled me then, had not Ned Lowe knocked up his weapon. What in the devil's name is all this? he cried out. Dick and stow your jaw. George, what happened? Why, Russell and I were fighting, I said bluntly. In the midst of it, Dickon there threw a knife and struck Russell in the back. That's all. A black lie, screamed the boy, flying into a fury of rage. It was you stabbed him as he leaned over the table. Never gave him a chance, and... Do not cast the stain of murder on the innocent boy, Mr. Roberts, spoke out Gunner Basil in his best preaching manner. A sanctified vessel is the lad. I plunged at him, but Ned Lowe caught my arm and flung me back. He turned a cold face to the gunner and ordered him on deck. It's your watch, and see that you keep it, he finished. This is none of your affair. I want no more words from you. Mind that. Basil looked him in the eye and dropped his gaze. Aye, sir, he said, and departed to the deck meekly. Ned Lowe took a step forward, leaned over the body of Russell, and pulled forth the knife. He rose up and gave Dickon a keen glance. Dickon, he said in a kindly tone, keep this matter to yourself, you understand? The little devil was no more astounded than I was, and could only stare and mumble something about Portuguese Lopez. Ned Lowe nodded thoughtfully. True, Dickon. The man was pirate and outlaw. Tell the boatswain to bring two hands here and remove the body, and no talking, mind. The imp gave me one exultant, diabolical grin and departed. No sooner was he gone, however, than Ned Lowe turned to me, a blaze of eager vehemence in his face. George, never mind talking. He burst out softly. Forgive me, lad. Don't you see? The little fiend is not alone. Gunner's with him, and more besides. When the call came, Cook Philip was just yammering to me about some trouble for it, and there's a gale breaking within the hour, and the sails to be handed. Let this matter pass for the moment. We'll make the boy confess his lie later on. You're right, I assented. And Ned, when Russell died, he was trying to tell me something. He heard the boy shouting at you and warned me of a trap. He tried to send you some message about the man Winter, but could not get it out. Lowe's eyes narrowed speculatively. Winter, and that proves my point. John had guessed the trouble for it. Thought the daft man was in it, eh? John was no fool in such things. Well, slip a pistol into your pocket from the locker, George, and take the deck. Or stay. You're weary. Go sleep and bar your door. There's deviltry afoot somewhere. I'll take this watch. We can't trust Gunner Basil. I nodded and went to my own cabin. There came a tramp of feet as a number of the men descended the ladder. Also I heard Polly Langton's voice and knew that the girl was aroused by the noise. Like a coward... I flung myself on my bunk and left Ned Lowe to do the explaining to the lass. After perhaps an hour of sleep, I wakened as the King Sagamore keeled over, almost on her beam ends, wakened to the trampling of feet, the shouts of men, the pipe calling all hands. Getting hurriedly on deck, I found that the blow had come. Except for a rag of sail forward, we were stripped to meet it. The first blast of the wind had sent us over, now there was peace for a moment, the ship righted, fell away, and then the main fury of the storm drove down. Through the darkness, the huge masses of cloud to windward were lightning shot, sending an eerie glare across the waters. Now we beheld it coming, 
a white line of spray and spin drift, racing down from the horizon under the glare of lightning. I was busy amidships, getting everything lashed down anew, when the keen, cold blast of wind smote us. I sang out to all hands to hold on, and we leaped to the lifelines. Then we were smothered under water and spray. Two of our men must have gone at that minute, for we never afterwards saw them. A poorer ship than the King Sagamore would never have risen out of that welter, for she laid over while three heavy seas swept her. Then she began to rise, the scrap of sail forward caught and held. She answered her helm and came before the wind, and we were off. That night the loss of those two men was felt badly for every hand was needed, and to add to our troubles the ship was making water, a butt having been loosened somewhere forward and the leak hard to get at. Nonetheless, we counted ourselves lucky all told, particularly in this, that the gale was driving us fair on our course, and we might look to raise the islands in two days or less. Now of the company that had left London, twenty all told besides Polly Langton, we had lost six. Aft, there remained captain, mate, and gunner, and we took the boatswain into our company as second mate. Forward were Dickon, Philip the Cook, Thomas Winter, and seven of the Sons of Righteousness who were led by David Spry, ten in all. It was by no means a large ship's company, but we could take on a few hands at the islands, for the Cape Verde men are glad to ship. So night wore into dawn again, and ever we fled south and south with the storm roaring at our heels, the King Sagamore picked up and hurled forward with a hissing rush by every mountain wave. With daybreak, the leak began to show so bad that I resolved to take it in hand myself, for it was beneath a timber near the well on the larboard side. Ordering Thomas Winter down into the hold with a lantern, I followed with David Spry to help me. We got the timber cut away about the trunnel, which remained fast in the plank. The butt had started indeed, and the water shot in the full breadth of the fourteen-inch plank. When we had somewhat checked the force of the stream with oakum, we moused the trunnel, took two clove hitches about it, and lashed the trunnel to a bar, just as a port is lashed. I had brought along two rollers or screws, such as we use in Virginia to roll tobacco hogsheads. These I screwed fast at each corner of the plank and then lashed them into the bar. All this took time and energy, and having done most of the work myself, I was half drowned and aching in every muscle of my arms when we finished. Now, David Spry, I said, fetch that caulking mallet and drive the oakum tight. Lay more oakum on, and you, Winter, Get us a chalk of wood. We'll nail battens over that, and I'll guarantee she won't weep. Aye, sir, said David Spry, picking the mallet out of the water. She'll not weep a drop. Thomas Winter held up the lantern high. I was leaning against a beam for support. In the yellow light, that half-witted face of Winter's altered suddenly to a look of such wild ferocity that I was for the moment paralyzed. She'll not weep, David Spry, he cried out in a bellowing voice. Strike, lad! The seaman struck, not at the seam, but at me. The mallet caught me above the ear and drove my head against the oak. So sudden, so unexpected and bitter was the assault, that before I knew what was happening I was dazed and reeling under the blow. I went down into the knee-deep water, and Spry flung himself on top of me, fetching me another crack that knocked the sense out of me. So there was I, taken like a pole-axed bull. When I wakened again, it was to hear my name called. I found myself lying in darkness, but on dry planks. When I moved, there echoed from the blackness a rattle of chains, and I found wrists and ankles in irons. By the surge and heave of the deck, the groanings of beams, and the creak of the rudder irons nearby, I perceived that I was lying in the lazarette aft, down in the run of the ship. George? came a voice again to me. George Roberts? Hello, Ned, I answered. Is that you? 
Aye, he replied as his foot touched mine. Art hurt? Not worse than a lump or two over the ear. You're not taken likewise? Taken without a blow, lad. His voice was bitter. They called me down, said that you needed me, and clapped a tarpaulin over my head as I came. Damn me. That half-wit winter has the strength of ten men. Well, here I am, and here you are. I was slow to speak, stunned by the realization of it. Mutiny at such a moment was madness, or so it seemed. Whom had they, except Gunner Basil, to manage the ship? And he was no navigator. I'd give a thousand pound, said Ned Lowe to know what it was John Russell tried to say about that devil winter. You don't think that it's he who has taken the ship, I demanded. No, no. Ned Lowe laughed a little. This is Polly Langton's doing, George. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of Pirate's Gold, Part 2 of 4, by H. Bedford Jones. If you have enjoyed this book, please become a regular supporter by going to classictalesaudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off anything in the store. Give more and you get more. Thank you so much for your support. And please leave us a review if you get a chance. It really helps other people to find our show. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. Deadline on Oak Street, Pile 3. Welcome to the housing market. I'm with Redfin, and I'm here to help. I need to sell my house. Great. Redfin charges a 1% listing fee when you buy and sell with us, which is more than half off the usual fee and saves you an average of $8,400. Oh, wow. Is that all? Uh, yep. I'm kidding. You had me at 1%. Want to win? Sell with Redfin. It's real estate done right. Bidding war at the offer's counter in five minutes. Average savings is Redfin refund plus 1% listing fee. Subject to minimums. Not available in all areas. Learn more at redfin.com.